Hey, everyone, and welcome to day six of Food Addiction Recovery Week on Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. You know, no conversation on food addiction would be complete without my next guest, who at one point was eating 10,000 calories a day, and it almost killed him. He is one of the few people that I talked to early on that actually believe in this concept of food addiction, and he's going to tell you his story. He's lost a tremendous amount of weight, almost 300 pounds. He is the host of one of the most fabulous shows you'll ever see on YouTube or listen to on iTunes. It's called The Exam Room Podcast. It's powered of PCRM, and he's actually at their annual conference right now. So if you see a slurry of people coming by, you'll know why. Please welcome Chuck Carroll. Oh, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I know you were, I think you were the first person booked. I think I really, when, now that I think about it, because you remember you had your choice of dates and times. I had this idea when we talked and I think you honestly were the first person. I mean, look, it's food addiction. I needed to get this on the calendar because it is just astounding to me how so many people still don't identify that food can be as powerful as a drug as anything else on any street corner or any bottle of beer or alcohol or whatever the case may be. Food can get its hooks in you and they are awfully hard to pull out. Absolutely. Well, you look younger and trimmer than the last time I saw you. So whatever you're doing, it's working. And I, I think a lot of people that follow me probably know your story, but you know, people find these YouTubes, they look at the titles and maybe they don't know your story. Yeah. It's uh, I, I did not always look like this. As a matter of fact, I mean, I turned 40 here in about a week and uh, I feel younger and I think I look younger than I did when I was in my mid twenties and weighed 420 pounds. Um, definitely was not always looking like this. And, um, I've put together a presentation that kind of walks people through my entire story, AJ, and, uh, also has a little bit of science in there about food addiction to really help people understand that what you talk about all the time, that's so important. What I talk about on the exam room is very real science and it helps people understand why it's so daggone hard to get that weight off and to keep it off. You know, it's, it is very much when you have a failed diet. And I don't even like to call it failed because you learn something every time. Um, it's just like a relapse, right? Yeah. But the cool thing is you can get right back on that wagon and, uh, and lead a healthy life. I've been calling it snack accidents lately. <laughs> snack accidents. That yeah. is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Because it, you know, it just doesn't feel as clinical and as, is you know, you know, you have a snack accident. Snack accident. I like that. I like that. I'm, I'm going to use that. I will that's credit a, you. That's credit okay. You. Yeah. That's all right. Oh, yeah. man. Um, well, it's so great, though, that you work with Dr. Neil Barnard because he yeah. does believe in food addiction. He wrote the book, Breaking the Food Seduction. He's done genetic research on the gene for addiction. So it must be wonderful to have that validation that, that we're not crazy. And they look at us now and because we're not overweight, they kind of like, but, but you know, I, I just heard about something that might interest you. I don't know who I can get on the show to talk about it, but I, I recently had a, a doctor, Dr. Jean Jack Wang, who's doing research at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, where they do a lot of research on addiction. And he talked about this concept that blew me away because I always felt like it was me, but I never had a word for it. He called it post-obese brain. And even though I've been slender 10 years now, I know that if you put me in the wrong environment, I'm going to be right back in the peanut butter jar. And yeah. Because it's like, even though I'm abstinent, my brain, given the right set of circumstances, is going to go right back and I'm going to get up to 200 pounds yep. again. Yep. Yep. It's, I never want to tell myself that I've got this thing 100% licked. I, I love the fact that you still identify with the fact that there is that portion of your brain that probably will never change. And as you said, given the right set of circumstances, you're going to do a nose first dive into a big old jar of peanut butter. Right. And that's so true for you, for me, for anybody. And that's why every day is kind of a practice. But the cool thing in practice is you get better at it every single day. And you prove to yourself every single day that you can lead this healthier life. And you don't have to do the cannonball into a jar of Skippy, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Skippy's even worse because it's not just the peanuts, it's the hydrogenated oil and the sugar and the salt. For sure, for sure. Oh man, I love peanut butter. But know. you know something funny you were talking about, Dr. Barnard, and, and, and I'll share the presentation here in a second if you don't mind, but one of the first shows I did with him and I was sharing my story, he kind of like stopped me and he was like, you know, it wasn't your fault what happened to you. And that was the first time anybody had ever said that. And I kind of like just paused. I was like, but 
I was the one who was going through the drive through. I was the one eating all of this food. What do you mean? It wasn't my fault. And then he walked me through it and helped me understand. And I was like, oh my God, this is why. And once you're kind of introduced to what's really going on, as the saying goes, some things can't be unseen. And so now it's incumbent upon us to really kind of pull the wolf that's covering everybody's eyes right now and showing them it's like, hey, this this is why we're in the state that we are in with our health in this country. Yep, absolutely. I, I must have felt really good. You know, some of the other experts, like it's not our fault, but now that we know this, it's our responsibility not to eat the foods that we know are going to perpetuate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can choose not to have that drink. You can choose not to have that cigarette, right? But it's not your fault that those substances are in fact addictive, right? They are, they are purposely addictive, right? So, and food certainly is no different. You know, I will always put Taco Bell in the same category as I do Marlboro cigarettes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me go ahead. If you don't mind, um, I would AJ, love it. Pull, pull up this, um, uh, presentation it kind of walks people through um my story here and um so for those who aren't familiar with the show it is called the exam room podcast i do it with the physicians committee and prior to doing this show uh, i was a reporter for both sports news with cbs and then later nbc so this is the old me chuck version 1.0 and at my heaviest i was 420 pounds five feet, five inches tall, had a 66 inch waist, and my shirt size was a 6XL. Today, 2.0, 140 pounds, still 5'5", five five, so I got smaller, just not taller. That's all right. 32 inch waist, and uh, the shirt I'm wearing is a small today. Never thought I would see the day. So the question AJ, that I think you probably get asked this a lot too, is like, well, how in the world did you ever get there? And of course, we're here today to talk about food addiction, very real. So you talk about is food addiction real? Emerging research coming out more and more on this, just like what we were talking about. And it's so important that people understand. I pulled this one particular study and look at what the conclusion was that the researchers in this one reached. You know, you look at this, you, highly processed foods may share characteristics with drugs of abuse. So you're talking about high dose, right? That's mass quantities of food. You want to eat more and more and more. Those are those cravings and you just can't stop. And rapid rate of absorption. So as soon as you take that first bite, your brain is lighting up like a Christmas tree. And we're going to talk about that experience in a little bit. And the thing is with food addiction and the way that we are by and large as a society, we get in trouble early. Look at this cute little guy here on the screen. I couldn't have been, but maybe two years old here. I was already in trouble. And so you, you talk about, well, food addiction, that's probably like an adult problem. Okay. But it's not. All right. So this particular study here that was released just a couple of years ago, meta-analysis found that there's a prevalence of food addiction of 15% already with kids and adolescents. And I would actually argue, AJ, you may agree with this. I mean, would you say that 15% seems to be a little bit on the low end? I think so. I heard 17% or one out of seven. I think it is very much on the low end because I do think it also exists on a continuum with some people being more and less vulnerable. But I think it's how then how do you account for the fact that 70% are overweight or obese? I, exactly. Exactly. It's it's such a, an enormous number. And you look at all of the foods that are marketed. I mean, I'm not sure that Happy Meals are still a thing, but if you go to any grocery store in America, you see all of the foods, all of the sodas, all of the juices that are marketed toward kids. I mean, they're starting their day with like cereal, which is nothing but sugar, 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 sugar. And, and so you get them like all revved up and hyper and hooked on that early in the day. And then they go to lunch and they're having pizza and French fries and chocolate milk and things like that. And then if they were like me, there's a lot of trips through the drive through at night too. So, you know, it's just it's 15, 17%, even that seems low. I mean, I really think it's got to be one out of two at the very least. But the thing is, you know, a lot of these kids, myself included, you get in trouble early and then you stay in trouble because just like any good addiction, it gets worse over time. The more you do it, the worse it gets. And for me, my chief vice was Taco Bell. I could not go a single day without going to Taco Bell. And my order never, ever, ever, 
ever changed, ever changed. And they knew me, they would see my car pull into the parking lot. And before I even got to the order board at the drive through, they were like, Hey, Chuck, the usual 20 bucks, please drive through first name basis with everybody there. So here's what the order always was two seven layer burritos. And you see the tail of the tape there, 860 calories, more than 30 grams of fat, more than 2000 milligrams of sodium. And we're just getting going because there were also two beef grilled stuffed burritos. They no longer sell the beef grilled stuffed burrito. They've made them even bigger now. And they call them the XL stuffed burrito. But at the time, two of these were 1400 plus calories, 64 grams of fat, more than 4,200 milligrams of sodium. Of course, you go to Taco Bell, you have to get the nachos, 760 more calories, close to 40 grams of fat. You see more sodium there, more salt. Chicken quesadilla had to get one of these, another 500 calories, close to 30 grams of fat, more sodium still. And then the cheesy potato burrito. Let me tell you about the cheesy potato burrito. This was my absolute favorite. And it horrifies me now to think that I love this at the time. This was nothing but a fried potato wedge. I mean, battered and fried and then wrapped up with like the nastiest grade F chili that tasted delicious to me. And then they put some uh, nacho cheese sauce in there. And then they rolled all of that up into a burrito and they called it the cheesy potato burrito. And one of these bad boys, close to 500 calories, 22 grams of fat. And one alone, look at, look at the sodium on that one, 1300 milligrams. That is insane. But because I was such a good customer, they always gave me a free caramel empanada for dessert. Weren't they kind? So what the heck? This was a freebie. You look at that. Compared to the other stuff, 300 calories and 15 grams of fat seems like nothing. But when you add everything up, the two seven-layer burritos, the two beef grilled stuffed burritos, the nachos bel grande, the chicken quesadilla, the caramel empanada, and the cheesy potato burrito. You're talking about 4,370 calories, close to 200 grams of fat, and then 10,420 milligrams of sodium. That is heart-stopping. Every single day, I would do this to myself, sometimes twice a day. But that was just one meal. That was my last meal of the day. There was some variation earlier in the day, but this is generally what my menu looked like. I would skip breakfast because I wanted to save those calories. I thought that it was the healthy thing to do. I thought that this was my, my commitment to ensuring my health, as heavy as I was and as out of shape as I was. Skipping breakfast and going right for this healthy lunch at Boston Market was the best play. And I would get a family meal, which was a half of a chicken like an entire half of a chicken and three large sides, typically like mashed potatoes with gravy, macaroni and cheese, and then cream spinach, which at the time, may, maybe there were things like this with you as well, AJ. At the time, I thought that because it was a vegetable, it had to be healthy. But when you add all of the cream to that spinach, not a whole lot remotely healthy about it. I mean, were, were there things like that that you used to eat back in the day, AJ, where you thought, man, this is really great at the time. And now you, you eyes have opened a little bit and you're like, eh, probably not. Well, the you, best. you know, your, your Taco Bell was my 7-Eleven. And you know, what, what 40 year old goes to 7-Eleven every single morning for a, a Coke Slurpee for breakfast with eight pumps of vanilla syrup and then a Dr. <laughs> Pepper Big Gulp. I mean, that's not normal behavior. No, no. No. Were you on a first name basis with the clerks there too? Oh my God, with corporate, because if the Slurpee machine was broken, <laughs> I would yell at them because I could, I had to have my fix. Yes. Yes. And it's very funny that you said 7-Eleven because I was not much of a Slurpee guy, but I loved their taquitos. So as a snack on my way home from work, I would stop off and I would get six of the Buffalo chicken taquitos and two big bottles of Gatorade, the fruit punch Gatorade I loved. And that was my snack on the way home. And then once I got home, I would order pizza and we would get these coupons in the mail, really targeting businesses. It's like buy four pizzas, get the fifth for free. So that's like, if you're going to have an all staff meeting, this is what you would do. But I was like, hot diggity. They are selling this right to me. This is Chuck's coupon. So let me call them up. So I would eat a pizza and a half, sometimes uh, two pizzas, depending on how hungry I was. And then, and then a few hours later, I would make my Taco Bell run. So when you add all of that up over the course of the day, that's how I got to 10,000 calories. 10,000 calories every single day. And the net effect of that wasn't just a big waste. It was my heart starting to give up on me. 
I'm in my mid twenties, AJ at this point, and I couldn't walk more than 10 feet without my chest beginning to really tighten. You see the elephant sitting on the chest. That's exactly what it felt like to me. I couldn't catch my breath. I had to stop. I would sweat profusely and it was scary because my grandfather, my father's father had died of a number of heart attacks. He had a series of them before one finally claimed his life. This was before I was even born. And then on my mother's side, her father, he also had had a number of heart attacks and had quadruple bypass surgery. So, and then my own father, by the way, uh, was also starting to have heart issues and had had a number of procedures there. And I'm just on the accelerated plan and I'm getting scared, right? What, what am I going to do? What can I do? Well, at the time I was working at a radio station, WBIG in Washington, DC. I cannot make this up. So serendipitous, big 100.3. And they come to me one day and they say, Hey, Chuck, would you like to endorse something called the cookie diet? Can you imagine this, AJ, the cookie diet? Um, this is an all timer. They said, what we want to do, we want to pay you to lose weight. We want to pay you to eat these cookies and just talk about it on the air. Now, here's how the cookie diet worked. Uh, these were not your famed snickerdoodle cookies, AJ. These were not even close. These were like sponge on the kitchen sink, maybe a sprinkle of cinnamon and a raisin in them if you're lucky. They were just garbage. But you would eat one of these cookies and then you would drink a lot of water with it for breakfast, do the same thing for lunch. And then they would just tell you to eat this ambiguously defined sensible dinner. And they never told you what it is that you would eat, what you should eat. They just said, make sure that there were some vegetables on your plate. And that was the only direction that I had. I want it to be really good. You see detox up on the screen now. Here's why I want it to be really good. So the first day I got through it and I didn't go to Taco Bell and I was okay because I was revved up. I was like, I'm getting paid to lose weight. I'm going to save my life and I get to eat cookies. This is fantastic. I'm going to be really good about this because I have to talk about it on the air. Day two started to really get these cravings. Like I really miss my Taco Bell. I started to get a little bit cranky. Like was, so you were just talking about AJ, like when the Slurpee machine may have been busted and you didn't get your fix. How did you feel? Right. Cranky, right? Angry, angry. Yes. Yes. People could have come up to me and said, Hey, great to see you. The sky's blue today. And I would have been like, get out of my face. I wanted right to now. punch him actually. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you said it. I felt it. <laughs> Don't I know it? Um, and, and so by day three, though, like we're talking about total panic inside and out. Literally, all of my thoughts were consumed by Taco Bell. Could do without the Boston Market, the 7-Eleven and the pizza. I needed my Taco Bell, but I wasn't getting it and I was freaking out. So in addition to being like super, super angry, I was also starting to feel sick. Like I was getting like a really bad cold or the flu. So I was in bed. And then like after a few hours, I just couldn't take it anymore. I was so angry. I got up out of bed and I just exploded and I, boom, I put my fist through a wall, which is the craziest thing. I put my fist through a wall because I wasn't getting Taco Bell. Like that doesn't even make sense. But then of course, I still want a Taco Bell after I punched the wall. So what did I do? I punched my fist through a door and I still was angry because I still did not get my Taco Bell. So what, what did I do then? I devised a plan. I couldn't take it, even though I was being paid to do this cookie diet, could not take it. So in the middle of the night, I snuck out of the house, didn't want anybody to know this because I didn't want to let anybody down, snuck out of the house, found the 24 hour drive through and loaded up on my $20 worth of Taco Bell. So that's detox. People ask like, what's it like when you go through detox on a diet, sick, angry, and then there's a feeling of helplessness as well. Helplessness because when I got back to the house with that Taco Bell and I took that first bite of that seven layer burrito, it was like suddenly everything went away. All of my cares gone. The anger gone, no longer feeling like I had the cold or the flu. I had the magical cure. And I felt this warm rush of just tranquility come over me. It was, it was the doggone thing. And then I felt really sad because that was the moment, AJ, that I realized that I was addicted 
to food. I was addicted to food and I did not know how I was going to break that cycle because I mean, we're just talking about day three and I'm in a full blown panic mode. Like, how am I going to go through life? I know I'm dying. I know that I can't walk more than 10 feet without my chest starting to, to feel like it's going to give out on me. I know that heart disease runs rampant in my family. I know that I'm really on the accelerated plan. I know that I'm not probably going to live to see 30 years old, but I still can't stop. And there's a lot that comes with that, that emotional toll, that realization and being that overweight. And you're supposed to be in the prime of your life in your twenties. But like I was dating this, this girl at the time and she refused to tell any of our mutual friends that we were dating. She refused to tell her family that we were dating any of her friends that we were dating. And she begged me, keep your mouth shut. And every day I would ask, can we please tell somebody every day she would say no. And the only reason I can think was because she was ashamed to be with somebody who was so large to this day. I don't know why she was with me. Maybe it was just because I had that radio job. I don't know, but it was like being stabbed in the heart every single day. So after the cookie diet failed, this is the biggest parallel that I can give today about drugs and food or substance abuse and food addiction. My friends actually tried to organize an intervention for me because after I was through with the cookie diet, they, they pulled the endorsement. After I was through with that, all of the weight came pouring back on. I mean, in a hurry. And I got up to my heaviest ever, 420 pounds. My friends had grown so concerned. They wanted to hold this intervention, but I got tipped off and I called the guy who was leading this, who I owe basically my entire career to and is one of my best friends in the entire world. But I read him the riot act because he then became my mortal enemy. He was standing in the way of myself and my Taco Bell. And that just would not do. That absolutely would not do. So I read him the riot act. I cut him out of my life. I cut the other friends who were going to be part of this out of my life because. I was not ready to end that relationship with food. Crazy, right? And then the last thing was a cross-country flight. I call it the flight of shame. And anybody who's flown knows that the airplane seats are notoriously small. At this point, I hadn't flown for many, many, many years. And I was praying, like, dear God, let me find a way to fit into this seat. Literally praying every night, the week leading up to this, let me fit in this seat. And I'm concocting ways that I'm going to make this work somehow, some way it's going to work. The day of the flight comes and I am just like sweating bullets here, literally and figuratively. And what I learned was that I was not the only person praying that day. Everybody on that plane was praying that day. But they weren't praying for me to be able to fit into my seat. They were praying for me not to sit next to them on that flight. Because when I made that right hand turn after boarding the plane to go up the aisle, it was like everybody stopped what they were doing and looked at me, folded their hands. Dear God, please don't let him sit next to me. Please don't let him sit next to me. And there was that sense of relief that I heard that little, thank God as I passed through every aisle until I eventually got to the back of the plane, got to my seat, sat down, said one more prayer, a Hail Mary at this point, please let me fit into the seat. And I tried so hard to buckle it. And I tried so hard again, and it wasn't even coming close. And I, I remember like lifting up my belly, even trying to get the seatbelt to, to fit just underneath of my belly. And it just wasn't happening. So I had to walk all the way again to the front of the plane and ask for seatbelt extender from the flight attendant and then walk back with the seatbelt extender in my hand. And then the prayers were gone. I just got stares of judgment from everybody and it was humiliating. And that was one of the worst experiences of my entire life. And so that then you're flying across country, you got a lot of time to think. So a lot of people think, well, was it one thing? No, it was the girlfriend. It was the intervention. It was the flight of shame, all of that stuff. Plus knowing that if I continued down this route, I wouldn't be able to fit into pants much longer. I was almost even out of the big and tall catalog and I wasn't going to live to see 30. 
I was convinced my heart would give out long before then. So that was my breaking point, And I didn't know what in the world I was going to do. I was in full blown panic mode. And so in this particular picture, this is me going to get a sleep study so that I could qualify for weight loss surgery. I knew still nothing about healthy eating at this point. All I knew was that my eating was completely out of control and I wanted to live. So I decided to go through with this weight loss surgery, knowing full well that people in my family had had it. I had had other close friends who had had weight loss surgery as well. And they lost a lot of weight for a few years, but just like any other diet, the weight always came pouring back. But I thought this will at least buy me some time. This will at least get me to 40. So that way I can go to my grave saying that I tried everything. And the thing about weight loss surgery, it's not so much about rerouting your intestines or being a shortcut or a cheat to lose weight. Because believe you me, there is nothing cheating about weight loss surgery. The biggest benefit from it, in my opinion, is the fact that it forces you to go through that detox. You, you literally don't have a choice because for three months or so, if you eat that food, if you eat those taquitos, if you go to Taco Bell, you are going to be sick worse than you ever have in your entire life. And so you're forced to go through it. And it was not fun. It, it really did suck, but it, it got me over that hump and the weight started to come off just like it did for my family members who had had it, just like my friends who had had it. So this is me about halfway or so through uh, the weight loss journey, lots of baggy clothes there and lots of cool things started to happen. Right. So I get my dream job. I had always loved sports. I started covering the NFL, doing my own sports media company. I started doing shows with a lot of the Washington commanders, football players, and really having a grand old time. And then I started dating and wound up uh, dating a girl who I had a incredible crush on in high school. And she was the one who first introduced me to the idea of healthier eating, right? Because the menus that weight loss surgery pays, nobody really talks about this, but the menus that weight loss surgery patients are given are just horrendous. Like they are literally the same types of foods that put them in the position to need weight loss surgery in the first place. So this, this particular girl winds up um, introducing me to the idea of healthier eating, not plant-based by any stretch of the imagination, but more whole food at least. So that was a huge step in the right direction. And then I parlay that sports media job into a job covering news for CBS. And so I'm just having the time of my life, but all the while I feel like the clock is ticking, right? I'm worried that all of that weight is still going to come back on. It was inevitable. It was a matter of time, not if, but when. And that is why, and that is when, this is a gentleman by the name of Adam Carricker. He played for the uh, Washington Commanders and he and I were doing a radio show and PCRM approached us, said, well, we know that you have an incredible weight loss story and we're looking for media personalities and athletes to take part in our uh, campaign to get people basically just to eat more vegetables. And this was perhaps, I had no idea at the time what a pivotal moment in my life this would be. But this was when I was first introduced to the idea of eating a plant-based diet. And man, am I ever glad this happened. I mean, so, so, so glad. Because what I discovered is, unlike the seven-layer burritos, unlike the beef grilled stuffed burritos and the nachos and everything else on the Taco Bell menu and at 7-Eleven and at Boston Market, you look here, which foods are not addictive? Well, it's the whole foods that I was starting to learn about. Apples, you look at this. You look at the, the three criteria that, that, that uh, these fine folks at uh, Yale have for whether or not a food is addictive, glycemic load, sugar, fat, fat, and then sodium, salt, right? So those are, that's, your, that's your trinity for addiction right there, my friends. And you look at the glycemic load of these things, it is so small. It is so small. You cannot become addicted to these foods. You will love them. You will absolutely love them but your brain won't spaz out if you go a day or two without eating an apple. It won't freak out if you don't get broccoli for a day or banana or corn or strawberries or any whole food. So you look at that where my diet had shifted versus where it was. 
And you're talking about a night and day difference. And as I learned more, I became more and more and more confident, like I might really be onto something here. And then I get introduced to the idea of calorie density, right? And I'm sure that a lot of people who are watching right now have seen a chart similar to this, if not this one, what 500 calories in the stomach actually looks like. Just a thimble full of oil is 500 calories. Cheese fills up the stomach just a skosh bit more, meat a little bit more. And then you get into the whole grains and then the fruits and the vegetables. And like every meal then can be like Thanksgiving at a 500 calorie cap. And it is fantastic. So when you learn about nutrient density, caloric density, and you put that together with the plant-based diet and the fact that those foods are so much less addictive, not addictive at all, even you're in pretty good shape. And that is when that confidence grew even more that I'm never going to find myself back in that Taco Bell drive through Now, never say never, but I certainly recognize and know a whole heck of a lot more now than I did back then. And I think that every day it is an exercise and choice, but I am always going to choose now that healthier, healthier road because there is no going back. Because just like you, AJ, have this incredible platform with the physicians committee and the exam room podcast where, I mean, you know, this with, with your show and, and all of your projects, is we reach so many thousands of people who feel like they could never do this. They feel like they're trapped in the struggle and it's, a, it's a vicious yo-yo dieting cycle that they'll never be able to break free from. But the truth of the matter is they're just one show away from, or one conversation away from having this epiphany, the same one that you and I had that have carried us into a healthier future. And there is no going back, you know, and it's, it's just so great. And then having the opportunity to stay inspired, speaking to people like you, who's such an inspiration. And then having Dean Ornish on the show is, is just incredible. And it's so inspiring every single day to be really just ensconced in all of this, this science and hope and reaching people like that. It's just truly the greatest feeling in the world. And then to watch the podcast grow and grow and to become the number one nutrition podcast in the U S perennial top five, sometimes number one, and all of these wonderful reviews from people that have poured in and to the people who are watching this today say they could never do this. I will tell you, no, no, you can do this. You got this. You absolutely do this because there's nobody who has lost this incredible amount of weight that has any more or any less of what you already have, because you do have everything it takes to succeed. You don't realize it, but that toolkit is always inside of you. It's just ready to open and ready for you to put it to work. So if you doubt that you can do it, I promise you, you have what it takes. I'm not Superman. AJ, I love you. You're not Superwoman. We are just human beings, but we are living proof that everybody has the internal fortitude to do what it takes to make these changes in their life, make a reality out of something that they think is completely impossible, and that is to break free of food addiction. And so this is me with an actual pair of my old pants uh, with the wonderful staff at Green Fair Organic Restaurant uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area. That's Gwen Whitaker and, and Pericles. They do such amazing work, all SOS food out there. And uh, I tell you what, AJ, uh, the next time you're in the D.C. area, uh, dinner is on me out there. I'm just for right. normal human uh, beings. But yeah. I want to get I want to I want to I want to picture in those pants, too. <laughs> we got I actually have the, the pants right here. Hold on. I can stand up. They they were just uh, off camera here. But yeah. These, these are the actual pants. Yeah. Right. Right there. So I carry these with me kind of as a reminder to, uh, never go back. And I, I never do, uh, want to go back to that. You know, this is life now is just too much fun. Every day is, is a gift, you know? I, you know, I, I always tell people like, don't keep your fat clothes, but keep one piece, one piece. Like that's that. my one piece. That's my one piece. Yeah. That's my one piece. Well, you, when, when people say you're not half the man you used to be, I mean, that's really an accurate statement, isn't it? Absolutely. But, but the funny thing is though, in my mind, you know, there's so many little excuses that we make for ourselves when we're overweight and we're putting off making these changes. You know, I would tell myself, well, okay, uh, I've got a 66 inch waist. My friend wears a 33 inch waist. He's not very big. So if I'm two of him, that's still not very big. I'm doing okay. But then to look at these jeans today, it's like, wow, 
Like I really thought that, you know, and these are those little, was it, was it like that for you too? It's like the little things that you would say to yourself to convince you that you can keep going in that, in that direction and be okay. You know, it's, it's total mind games with yourself. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, it, you just look around you and you're like, well, compared to all the other people I see, I'm not really that bad. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, um, uh, I am privileged enough to say also that, uh, I've repaired the relationships with everybody who wanted to have that intervention, uh, for me and, and, uh, we're dear friends and, and they totally recognized what was going on. Yeah. And, um, you That's know, a really important thing I want yeah. to ask you about, because I don't know if you've been able to watch this week, because I know you're at a conference, but I'm having people on like yourself that have lost hundreds of pounds, some who actually gained some or all of it back. Mm -hmm. And they basically said to me, you know, because I because because these are also my friends and, and I see, you know, when I see somebody gaining a lot of weight, like I want to help them. Yeah. But it's almost like you have to be very careful with what you say and how you say it. Yep. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the person has to be ready to change. Otherwise, it's you're going to they are going to feel like they're under attack. So you can have sympathy, you can have compassion. But if that person isn't ready to change, the best thing you, me, anybody can do is just be there and ready for them when they are, you know, and don't judge them. God knows, like I'm not in a position to judge anybody having been there myself. I absolutely want to help. I have this desire to like, just throw my arms around them and like, let me show you the way, but they have to be ready. And you, me, we're here. We're ready whenever they are. God, I just can't imagine the pain they're going through. And that's why I just like, you know, you, you know, it's like, if you have a kid, you, you know, you, you want to help. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely want to help. You absolutely want to help. But, you know, I, I, I think back and when I was in that position, I was always kind of paying attention to the success that other people were having around me. And I was always kind of just watching from afar, you know, what is this person doing that I'm not, what do they know that I don't. And so I was just kind of like picking up on those little nuggets along the way. And then during my journey, when it finally clicked and I stopped yo-yo dieting and, and I got on this healthier path for good, you know, it's like all of those little things that I had learned along the way, I started to put into practice and I understood why they were doing the things that they did and how they were working to that benefit. And so every day is really kind of an educational opportunity. I don't care who you are or where you are. The fact of the matter is inspiration and knowledge. It's all around you, you know, just look for it and, and learn, you know, and better yourself from it so that it goes back to that toolkit that I was talking about, right? You're always adding to that arsenal, that toolkit. You've got like an enormous tool chest inside of you that you can tap into at any time and make the most extraordinary changes, including beating food addiction. And so it's just realizing that you have all of that in your arsenal and it's locked and it's ready to go. And then that belief in yourself, and that's a huge part of it, right? That belief in yourself. And when all of that comes together, man, magic can happen. You know, Lewis, who's watching lives commenting five foot five carrying that much weight blows my mind. Like it's incredible. That's even possible when you think about it. Five. Yeah. Five, five and uh, 420 pounds. Like it, it was a labored kind of a life to move around. Um, the one of the few carryovers from my old life to now is that uh, I have bad crepitus in my knees. They don't hurt whatsoever. Like I feel fantastic, but if I squat down, it sounds like rice Krispies, right? There's a whole lot of snap, crackle and pop. And, um, but they sure hurt at the time. And my back was forever hurting. I mean, like I remember going to the doctor at one point and I hadn't even done any sort of physical exercise or whatever. It was just like, I was carrying around so much weight. The doc gave me muscle relaxers and said, Hey, take these and then take it easy for the next few days. But you know, I don't care how easy you take it at 420 pounds, like that's so much stress on your joints that there's only, you know, so much you can do at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just an incredible thing. It must feel amazing to be you now. Suzanne is saying, do well-meaning people in your life ever comment that you're too thin now? <laughs> Would you believe? Yes. Um, all of the time. Um, and so that's an interesting conversation because if you look at my numbers on the BMI scale, uh, I am smack dab in the middle of normal. And uh, people also are like, well, 
what about your extra skin? Do you have extra skin? Yeah. But even if you account for say like the 10 or 15 pounds of extra skin that I have, I'm still in the normal range of BMI. So then what is normal? If 44% of the population has obesity, if three quarters of the population are overweight, you know, what's normal then, right? I think that our sense of normalcy is actually skewed. So I don't worry too much uh, about what it is uh, that they say. Um, and certainly having the opportunity to work with physicians every single day as well. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with where I am. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I don't know much about the gastric bypass surgery, but because you had it, I can ask you a few questions that might help people. You had mentioned that you couldn't go back to eating Taco Bell because you would get very sick. Did you ever try though? And, and what happened? Never, never went back to Taco Bell. I kind of made up my mind uh, once I got past a certain length of time and had gone without it. Uh, that I was never going to go back, right? Because I'm never going to put myself in a position again. Uh, what I told myself, I'm never going to put myself in a position again to need to do this surgery a second time. And this is something that not a lot of people also realize is that when you go in for a consultation, the doctors will tell you, if you put the weight back on after this, don't worry, we got you. You can come in and have what they call a revision surgery where they'll do it a second time right? So you have to go through the process a second time, you know, and they never really teach you, at least in my case, they never really taught me about what healthy eating was. And the menu that you're given is a lot of the same stuff that brought you there in the first place. It's like, eat your baby cheese, right? Go ahead and have meatloaf just a little bit, right? Uh, go ahead and get some American cheese slices, and roll that up with a slice of ham and call that good, right? And so those are the things that they're teaching you to eat and by God, drink as much milk as you possibly can, right? So it's a, over time, you can eat more and more and more and more, but if you're eating unhealthy things, what's the point of eating more and more and more and more of it, right? So if you go and you pull the numbers, you'll see that people who have this surgery, there is an enormous weight loss initially but then at about 18 to 24 months, you start to see that bend in the curve go right back up. You know, it's like you've hit that dip and now you're on that incline and uh, you're on that roller coaster again and you're going to start yo-yo dieting. Um, and the stomach is, it's so elastic as well that it's not a very small stomach for long. You know, initially it's teeny tiny, right? It's like the size of your thumb, four ounces is, is the max that you can get. But over time, you know, it expands back out to a normal size stomach. And so I, I did not know that. Okay. Yes, I said, I yes. did. So you actually had the one where I like, cause there's different types of weight loss surgery. Yes. Yes. So I had, uh, I had a uh, ruin Y gastro bypass surgery, um, which, you know, is, uh, I call it the Cadillac of weight loss surgeries. Um, it's, it's one of the more invasive. Um, but yeah, I mean, your stomach can, can get as, as big as ever over time, you know, and, and, there are people who I'm very, very close to who have had the procedure and uh, lost an incredible amount of weight and have put an incredible amount of weight back on and then some and sadly are heavier than they've ever been. And this is after having that procedure. And so what they does, hasn't changed anything, their mindset, their behavior, what they that's, ate. And it, that's just it. Right. So it's like you can you can break your insides, uh, but you you're not breaking addiction. Right. Because you're going right back to it and you're being encouraged to go back to it. You know, the surgeon, here's the craziest thing. I will never forget this day is, is, is when I had lost probably about 220 pounds at this point, the surgeon's like, Chuck, you've lost enough weight. You need to eat a hamburger. Not you can, not you can, you need to eat a hamburger. And at that time, again, I didn't know a daggone thing about food addiction. I didn't know a daggone thing about a plant-based diet, but what I did know at that time was that if I were to eat that hamburger, I was going to need that revision surgery. I knew that all of the progress, that hard work that I had put in was about to be for naught. And I looked him in the eye and I was like, you must be crazy right now. And he really didn't know what I was talking about. And I was like, dude, you are putting crack back into the palm of somebody who had just gotten over an addiction, right? That is horrible, horrible advice. He didn't agree, but, you know, we've, we've since had conversations uh, about why that's, that's, 
probably not the best advice to give. I don't think he's he's saying that so much anymore. But again, it just goes to this disconnect that for whatever reason, uh, we don't put food in that same category as we do, you know, drugs and alcohol. It's it's incredible to me, but it absolutely belongs in that same bucket. Absolutely. At least certain foods. How many years ago was your weight loss surgery, Chuck? Uh, 13 at this point. Yeah. And at what point did you find out about a plant-based diet? It wasn't until, uh, maybe like five and a half, six years ago. Um, and I had actually gone up and down a little bit, had some emotional turmoil in my life. So gained a little bit of weight, turned to a lot more vino than I should have been drinking, turned to, uh, you know, um, not Taco Bell, but, uh, certainly, uh, Tostitos and, and, um, things like that, some chips, uh, introducing things back into my system that I shouldn't have. And I got as high as like 175. Again, not a lot of people know this. And, uh, and then uh, when I got that turmoil squared away, I lost a little bit of weight and then went on a plant-based diet. And then boom, all of the rest of that garbage that I had been carrying around came off. And, um, but yeah, for the last six years, the, it really has been for the first time in my life that I don't have to worry where I feel like I don't have to worry so much about that weight ever coming back on. I feel like yeah. this is it from, from now on. Cause that's what I was going to ask you. Do you ever worry you're ever going to go back to 430 pounds? I, I never want to be overly confident about it. I know it's not going to happen today, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, I mean, I think it would, it would have to be an extraordinary set of circumstances for that to happen. But I, again, I will never say never. You, know? you don't want to get cocky, but you, you want to no. be confident without being cocky. Absolutely. I think anybody who's recovering from any sort of addiction, if they get cocky, that is really kind of tempting fate. So uh, be confident in uh, where you are today. That's the best you, way to You put know, it's it. interesting when I watched your slides, like, I, I mean, I, I, I used to binge and eat extra, I don't know how many calories a day, but like nothing on your menu appealed to me. You know, I just <laughs> wanted dessert and it's like, you don't seem like a dessert guy to me. I, I I would not have ordered the caramel empanada if they didn't throw it in there for free. I mean, that was really the only sugary thing that was on there. I mean, I'm sure that there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of added sugar in those foods unbeknownst to me, but no, I was always a salt guy. I was always a fat guy. Fat give salt. Me You're a fat salt, salt guy. I'm a fat sugar girl. Hey, I, I, yeah, I would love to see research on whether, you know, men are more inclined to be addicted to salt than they are to sugar. Cause my wife also has one heck of a sweet tooth. Um, you know, and I find that with a lot of the women that I meet, but then the guys who I talk to, um, you know, who are recovering or want to get into that, that boat with us, uh, it's, it's always like the hamburgers and the French fries for them. Not so much the cake and ice cream. Right. And it's some refined, it's flour too, flowers in there in the buns and yes. in the yes. So interesting. Yeah. So we'll it'd be good. Cause if we were together, we wouldn't be in each other's food. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, it. your snickerdoodle cookies now are just, but those are okay to eat. They're just, they are. just literally dates out cinnamon and vanilla. I mean, you, they're legal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and look, I, I guarantee you, like if I were to take a bite of the caramel empanada now, and then a bite of the sugar, uh, the, the, your cookie, like it wouldn't be able to hold a flame. The caramel empanada would quickly get discarded in the trash. It, I'll it never eat it. Egg but, taste, yeah. Chemical taste now. I think yes. it was, yeah. Yes, that's the thing. But like, I, I fully expect that if I were to ever just on a whim, on a really bad day, take a bite of that, I am sure that the first bite would just taste horrendous to me. But I also am smart enough to know that the brain wouldn't, there are parts of the brain that wouldn't necessarily think it was so horrendous and would immediately start craving more. Absolutely. Well, Gina says, thank you, Chuck, for telling your story. I hope you have a wonderful birthday and many more years of health. You, you know, we've gotten a lot out of you, but we haven't gotten a book out of you yet. No, no, no. Um, so I, I think that um, the next couple of years, there may be some fun things on the horizon that may be coming out. Um, so I guess stay tuned is kind of the best way to put that. I would love to be able to um, to put it down in, in book form and share a lot of what I've learned. Um, there's a brilliant neuroscientist who I'm dear friends with at the University of Miami, Dr. Mickey Witt. And she is kind of uh, my, my food addiction guru. And so she and I uh, are very close and, and working together on a few things. And uh, hopefully a book will be uh, one of those things, you know, kind of partner, um, or pair 
uh, my story with her smarts, you know, and this is, this is her arena. And, um, and so I think that uh, we'll be able to put something together. That's pretty powerful. That is amazing. Oh, gosh. So what's the best part about not weighing three, 430 pounds anymore? It's, I mean, just waking up every single day. And it's, it's like, I still can't believe that this is my life. It like, forget the career part of it. It's just like waking up and being healthy. It still feels so foreign to me. It's like, okay, so now I'm like five, almost six years into the vegan journey. Right. But like 13 years into my health journey overall. Right there's still such an enormous part of me that identifies with that 420 pound guy that I think when my eyes first open in the morning, that's the guy, you know, who, who's, you know, brain I'm operating with is that 420 pound guy. So then like, when I like rub the sleep out of my eyes and I like, I was like, Oh, okay. I'm not 420 pounds anymore. Like pinch me. Like that's the coolest thing to me is like, having life 2.0 and it never gets old. And it's, it just seems so brand new every single day. And that just gives me such enthusiasm and zest for life. Like that to me is the best part. And being able to walk, walk up the stairs without losing my breath is also very fun to this day. Um, but really it's, it's just waking up in the morning and just like, wow, this yeah. is really cool. Linda says, you're amazing, Chuck. Thanks for telling your story. You know, I didn't realize that you could bypass the bypass and the stomach got larger because how do you tell people or, or how do we help people? Because, you know, we, with understanding calorie density and people wanting to lose weight, we recommend, you know, larger volumes of more calorically dilute food first. But if somebody has a very small stomach, how can they get enough nutrition and low calorie dense food in on a plant-based diet? I mean, so initially there's just no way. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if you're working with a stomach that's the size of your thumb, there's no way you're going to be able to get everything that you need just by food, right? It's, it's impossible. So you will be relying on supplements at first. Um, but then you just have to make a, a practice of it as, as you begin to, like, if you're fresh out of surgery and then you begin to reintroduce uh, pureed foods first and then soft foods, and then back to the regular diet, just make sure that you're eating a, a lot of those healthier foods that have a lot of nutrients in it. Don't focus so much on the calories initially, because um, you just can't, you absolutely just can't. But if you start training your body to get as much nutrients as possible from food uh, at the time, you're setting yourself up for success down the line, because as the stomach gets bigger and bigger, you're going to be able to absorb more and more and more of those nutrients. Um, so that's, that's kind of the key there, but then also, you know, you're encouraged to drink smoothies. You're encouraged to like drink protein drinks and things like that. So as you know, there may be a million and two delicious, uh, vegan, healthy, whole food, plant-based smoothies that people can enjoy. And you can enjoy those straight away, um, after your surgery. So like once you're about a month out, you know, you can really start reintroducing that stuff and uh, getting those healthier foods into your system. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think, I think I know the answer, but Cherry says, did you ever have the skin removal surgery? If that's not too personal? No, I, I get this one all the time. Uh, no, I have not. Um, I'm lucky in that it doesn't hang around my face. Uh, it is conveniently tucked around, uh, my abdomen <laughs> and my thighs and I've got some, some wings on my arms. Um, but you know, eventually I, I probably will get it removed, but, um, it doesn't really, bug me too terribly much. Uh, it's just kind of a reminder of how far I've come. Yeah. It's sort of like your battle scars. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Well, if you ever decide to do it, Rebecca, who was on this week, got everything done, you know, cause she had lost, she was a female that over 50 years, she had, you know, over 300 pounds. And when she lost two, so she's, she, she researched this thoroughly found the best surgeon and aftercare. And anyway, it was amazing. She didn't even take any pain pills. What can I tell you? Wow. She is a warrior. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Randy says, did you meet your wife while you were still heavy? No. Uh, fun fact. So my wife was uh, on TV in the Washington, D.C. area for many, many years. And um, I always had a crush on her. Like, I thought she was just the most gorgeous woman I had ever seen. And we had some mutual friends because I was in radio. She was in TV. But I never had the confidence to ask her out. And so um, lo and behold, uh, many years uh, 
later. Um, she and I wound up working together at the CBS news station in town. She was doing traffic uh, on the afternoons and, uh, and I was a reporter. And one day I just kind of like hit the talk back button that went right into her studio. And I said, hi, and uh, I was a nervous wreck, uh, but we never stopped talking. And so um, I guess I had gained enough confidence at that point to eventually ask her out on a date. And so uh, we'll be celebrating our seventh wedding, uh, seventh wedding anniversary in October, and it'll be 10 years together overall uh, this December. Very nice. Yeah. So we, we kind of touched on this a bit with the, the smoothie idea, but Heather said, after having the weight loss surgery, was it hard to eat a whole food plant-based diet? I heard it can be hard to get nutrients. Uh, <laughs> so again, as your stomach is small, it's really hard to get all the nutrients that you need from food anyway. So there are supplements. Um, there are certain things that after certain weight loss surgery, uh, surgeries, your body has a more difficult time absorbing. So for me, um, iron is like the one nutrient where I really kind of have to monitor and make sure that I'm getting enough. And if I'm not, then that is one supplement that's outside of the typical B12 um, that I will, you know, uh, turn to just to make sure that my, my levels are normal. Um, that that's the bypass part of it. So um, if you, <laughs> that's just the, the part of the intestine that gets bypassed is the part that absorbs the most iron. Um, but um, you can get the majority, uh, well, virtually all of the other nutrients that you need uh, through food. Um, again, with the exception being B B12, it's, it, the, the rules then are just the same as they are for anybody else. You know, in order to get all of those nutrients, you have to eat a wide variety of food. You know, you eat the same thing every day. That nutrient profile is a lot narrower than it should be. So eat that wide variety of food and you should be in pretty good shape. Just if you've had the, uh, the gastric bypass, watch out for that iron. Yeah. You know, I didn't realize you had a snack accident and gained a little bit of weight during your journey. And I'm curious, it, because if you ate something hyper palatable, like, and it caused you to gain a little bit of weight, you still were able to put the brakes on. Some people yeah. aren't. Some yeah. people, I've seen people literally gain 200 pounds back, yeah. uh, several people. And because do you think there's an individual difference in how susceptible we are once we get that sugar, fat, and salt in our mouth after not having it for a while, because you were able to stop? I think that the biggest benefit for me there was that epiphany that I had uh, on night three of the cookie diet, where I took that bite, that seven layer burrito, and like finally realized like, oh my God, I'm hooked on this. So even though giving up uh, the Tostitos again uh, sucked and giving up cookies um, there were baked goods and stuff that I was enjoying that I probably shouldn't have at the time either, even though I don't have much of a sweet tooth, uh, I needed comfort at that time. But once that emotional situation kind of got rectified, I was able to put the brakes on it. Would I have been able to do that without that epiphany? Probably not, but I did carry with me that confidence that I had already done this and I knew that I could do it again. So even though that those cravings were there, um, I did know, just as I've said a, a number of times, that I already had that that tool chest inside of me that I could tap into to succeed in the long run. So that's exactly what I did. Wasn't easy, but you can do it. Yeah, but I, I love that you know you you gained a little bit of weight, but you didn't gain it all back. You know, no, no, no. that's good. Uh, Annette says, does the fact that you lost so much weight mean that you have to eat less than other guys your size? Because I heard of this concept from some of the doctors on the Truth About Weight Loss Summit about metabolic disadvantage that you, if somebody else is your height and weight, but they never were overweight, they get to eat more calories than you. I mean, I guess you could look at it like that. The, the, <laughs> the bigger the person is, the more they're going to eat like, you know, height, uh, height ways, uh, height. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say? Uh, but yeah, uh, the larger the, the person, the more calories they're going to consume. I mean, they just require more energy. What are you going to do? I don't worry about that. I eat plenty. Uh, nobody's ever said, dude, you're not eating enough. Um, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I don't really worry about it. Um, but the one thing I am very aware of, uh, also, uh, this is very important is recognizing when I am full and not eating past that, because that also is kind of like opening Pandora's box. That's something that I used to do a lot back in the day, right? It takes a strong will to eat all of that Taco Bell, right? So I, I wanted to make sure that, um, this go around, I, I never did that. And so um, I just tell myself when I'm full, 
and I still feel like I should keep going. It's like easy does it, man, because the food's still going to be there in a few hours when you're hungry again. So don't worry about it. The food's not going anywhere. Just hit pause and then come right. back to it. And that right. helps. Like it's, it's the little things like that, AJ, that, that helped the most for me now along this journey. Right. Well, Clark says you're an inspiration. When you were, you, you had developed this habit of eating this food a lot. So it couldn't all be just emotional eating. You know what I mean? That, that's why I think it's an addiction because yeah, you've had bad days and you might've medicated with food, but there was such a compulsion to have it all the time. No question. I mean, like a bad day could trigger it. A bad day was like the excuse. Um, but yeah, good days, bad days, best days, worst days. Like it didn't matter. Right. Like there was always going to be that food. Like emotion was irrelevant. Right. The, it was just all, it wasn't emotion. It was just motion going through the motion of going to the drive-through. Right. I was just like a machine, like cranking it out. Here's 20 bucks. Here's your heart attack in a sack. Here's 20 bucks. Here's your heart attack in a sack. And every single day it was the same thing. And so like, there wasn't really a whole lot of thought or emotion that went into it. It was just compulsion just going through the motions of, of eating garbage. Absolutely. What well, tell us like a little bit about what you eat today? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, let me tell you what's uh, uh, being served at the conference here. Um, today, I just had like this wonderful, like chickpea curry thing on brown rice that uh, the vegan roadie, I don't know if you know him, Dustin Harder. He's, uh, he's crafted together a uh, part of the physicians committee's incredible universal meals program. And so we just had like a wide array of samples up there. One of which was the, was the chickpea curry that was just fantastic. There was also uh, uh, some sort of uh, not mac and cheese that was up there. I think it may have been made from like butternut squash or something like that. Um, some sort of fanciness there that was really good. Um, there was uh, some sort of a, um, a quinoa salad that was there that was also pretty daggone tasty. Um, but if I'm at home, my favorite thing in the world is uh, a kitchen sink salad. Now, before you say, oh, here's the vegan talking about eating salad. Let me tune out this guy. No, nah, he's lost me. No, this is not your salad. There just happens to be some greens in it, right? This salad has like grains in it, right? So it's either brown rice or quinoa or farro, like whatever I want, whatever's in the fridge is going in there, right? And then you got to get some bean in there, whether it's chickpeas or black beans or pinto beans, it doesn't really matter. That's going in there. And then I am notorious for roasting vegetables in the air fryer. So everything that I got in the fridge that I've been roasting that week, whether it is squash, whether it is uh, uh, red peppers, whether it is Brussels sprouts, broccoli, whatever the case may be, whatever vegetable I have roasted, that's going in there too. And then I'm always going to cut up a sweet potato and it's got to be like really, really, really soft. Here's your pro tip. Really, really, really soft sweet potato that you bake to perfection. And then you take the skin off of that. You put that in the salad and then you put a top on your salad, right? You want to make the salad in a big, big, big bowl. And then you just shake it up. You shake it, you shake it, you shake it. And then that sweet potato kind of spreads out over the greens and the grains and the vegetables in there. And that becomes your dressing. What does a sweet potato not have? Fat. So now you've got a fat-free dressing there that is sweet, it is succulent, it is fantastic, a whole bunch of roasted vegetables, you got some amazing grains and greens in there. And let me tell you something, even the old 420 pound me would have appreciated the heck out of the salad. That is how good it is, right? That is absolutely how good that, that is. That is my favorite thing in the entire world to eat, hands down. It sounds delicious. Maybe you could show it sometime. Come on the show and make it because my mouth is watering. It's <laughs> you, you got a deal. You got I a deal. Love it. Do you eat, do you eat three meals a day or do you snack or do you just kind I of do. I, when you're I do. Um, so it's, it's three meals. Um, I, there, there is a lot to be said for fasting. Um, I am not in that group. Um, I just make sure not to eat late at night. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I will eat three meals and then, uh, sometimes a snack if I'm feeling like eh, I could use a little bit more. So, uh, that's it. But again, like the key for me is just not eating past full. And the thing is the other discussion that I like to have for people is like, okay, well, I'm doing what works for me. AJ, you may be doing what works for you. And for each of us, what we're doing works very, very well, but 
that may not work for somebody else, right? You have to find what works for you. You can hear advice from me. You can hear advice from you. You can read a lot of research studies and you do, you take all of this great information that's out there and then you put it all together in a way that makes the most sense for you in a way that works for you. And that's how this becomes something other than a diet and turns into a lifestyle that is sustainable so that you don't have to wake up in the morning in total fear that you're going to go through uh, a relapse, or as you call them, snacksidents. Um, <laughs> I you know, love it's a yeah. gent- kinder, gentler term. You know, uh, Chuck, bear bear with me, girl, who has been on the show before watching from Hong Kong. Nice to see you again. She writes in the chat that any food addiction is actually the addiction to sugar, oil, and salt. And, you know, we have a lot of the people on this week, a lot of the medical doctors who say, do not eat sugar, oil, and salt. And I'm thinking that's a big part of the food that you were eating. Huge, huge. I mean, there, there was a very specific reason why I had the, the, the fat, the calories and the salt in that Taco Bell menu, uh, because they are just some of the most toxic substances. I mean, salt, added salt is just one of the, the craziest things in the entire world. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree with these things. But just like any good old drug, you know, the more you use, um, the less of a reaction you get. So you, you got to get more. You're always chasing that high. Right. Again, it's just like a drug user. It's just like an alcoholic. You start using just a little bit. You start drinking just a little bit. But over time, you're using a lot. You're drinking a lot and you're eating a lot, too. You got to get more and more and more salt. So she's absolutely spot on with the salt, the oil the sugar. Yeah, absolutely. Heather says, Chuck, you're very inspiring. Thanks for sharing your story. Do you exercise or did you start right away as you were losing the weight? I am, uh, I'm not anti-gym, but the gym was not for me. So this goes back to kind of finding what works for you. So I, I walked, all right. So, uh, there's no shame. I don't care how old you are. Uh, I always thought walking as exercise was just for old people, but there I was in my twenties, I could barely walk across the street, but that's what I did. And I would sit down for 15 minutes and then I would walk back to my desk. I would finish up the day. Eventually I found that I could walk around the block and then it became two blocks and three. And then the day that I found out that I could walk a mile, like what a day that was. And then it became two and three. And eventually every day on my lunch break, I was walking five miles. I was so dedicated. It didn't matter if it was raining or if it was snowing or sleeting. Like I was out there walking on ice. I had to get my five miles in um, without fail. And so that was pretty much the extent of my exercise until very much later on uh, when I learned that I could run up a flight of stairs without, you know, becoming gassed or blowing up, as I like to say. And so uh, that just kind of became fun for me as well. Um, so I, I would run stairs religiously at work as well. Um, and that's that's the other thing, right? So it's like if you build things like that into your your work day, like if you're able to go out on those walks during work, you don't have to worry about dragging yourself to the gym later at night when you are uh, when you're already low, tired. Low battery, Chuck. That may be, I may be switching cameras here. Uh, I'll, I'll that's all right. We're going to switch. We're going to switch cameras here. I believe that the, the battery uh, that's on the, uh, the pro cam over there uh, may be dying. Oh, so I'm goodness. just going to switch over here. Hello again. Thank goodness you're back. I, yeah. Hi. <laughs> huh? There we go. <laughs> you know, it's so nice hearing you talk because even though I watch your show quite a bit, you don't get to talk a lot. I mean, you do, but you're not about yourself, you know? No, no. The show's not about me. The show's about the uh, the science and the other doctors who are there. So um, I really like to give them the opportunity to shine. But it is a, it is a real treat for me to be able to share this story. And I, I like I love the fact that so many people are commenting right now um, and they're finding inspiration from it. Like to me, that that makes all of the hard work and like the, the long nights, um, very much worth it. It makes the journey all the more, more worth it because it is, it's just opening people's eyes to the fact that they can do it too. Absolutely. And what do you say to the ones that have given up hope that they could do it? Ah, boy, you know, first I'm sorry, but second, don't give up hope. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. It's not going to be easy. If it was, everybody, you know, would be doing it. But you have absolutely what it takes. And I don't care 
you know, who you are or where you are in life. If you're drawing breath, you can absolutely make changes to your benefit. And I know like the old me would hear somebody say that be like, yeah, what is that guy? You know, he's so trite, you know, he's the exception to the rule, you know, he's the anomaly. I'm telling you, man, like it's, it's 100% real. Like do not give up hope because once you prove to yourself that you can do this thing, just like one time, one time, not giving into that craving, you've already proven to yourself that you can do everything required to beat this beast, right? And get yourself on that healthier track. So if you do that one time, you can do it a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and every single day until those cravings become less and less and less and less and less. And yeah, they'll still be there. You know, to this day, I still get random cravings for Taco Bell from time to time, but I know that I can get through it. And even when those cravings are hell and torture, the other thing that I tell people is like, listen, don't fight the craving but don't give into it. Don't fight it, but don't give into it. Well, what does that mean? I call it accepting the suck. All right. Not the most pleasant term, but accept the fact that for right now, your life probably sucks, right? There's just no other way to put it. So if you accept the fact that you're going to be uncomfortable for 15, 20, 30 minutes, however long that craving is going to last, somehow it becomes a little bit more palatable. You're not fighting this feeling. You're accepting it, but just by accepting the feeling doesn't mean that you have to give in to the craving, right? It just makes it a little bit more manageable and then it passes. And again, you've proven to yourself that you have what it takes and everybody has that ability. I love that. Accept the suck. That's <laughs> great. You know, it's funny because it's been 20 years, almost it's been 19 years since I've been off sugar and 10 since off flour. And I don't get a lot of cravings, but once in a while I get a craving. I don't know why for black licorice. It's the weirdest thing. And, you know, so I have some fennel black licorice that I know, who it's, thought? and it's not, and you know it technically i mean it's it's very low in fat i probably could get away with it but see i don't like to wake the the you know, this is something dr pam peak said the sleeping dragon of addiction never wakes up in a good mood so mm. i don't want to poke the beast i don't want to tempt it i don't want to i just it's not worth it no no the satisfaction that you would get in that moment is nothing compared to the way that you're going to feel afterwards um, and that realization, like, uh oh, what did I just do? You know, what did I just do? Is it really worth it? No, it absolutely is not worth it. You know, I, I know that that's an unpleasant feeling and I'm all about feeling good. So I don't want to do anything that's going to take me away from my, my feel goods. Because I don't have snack accident insurance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think you have to buy that at True North or something. Yeah, right. Uh, Melinda says, do you ever do shows on what you eat routinely or any uh, th thought of writing a cookbook? I, I don't know if I've got quite your culinary skill set, AJ, but uh, I might. I mean, there's so many things that you can do with the air fryer to roast the vegetables. It's like, I'm not a culinary whiz, right? Like, uh, I'm just not. But I know how to do certain things. And I found that cooking is a lot easier than people think that it is, especially like when you got all of these fun gadgets you can bring into the kitchen that do the work for you, like air fryers. It's just like you set it and you walk away and it does everything for you, basically. Like your hardest job is chopping things up, basically. Right. And anybody can chop anything up. It doesn't have to be a beautifully diced onion or anything like that. Just chunks, man. Just make chunks and throw it in there. You're going to like chew it all up anyway, right? So, yeah, maybe, you know, it, it could just be like the every man's cookbook, every man and woman's cookbook, right? I, love I it. want everybody. I, I got to read you these funny comments. Lissa says, I wonder if the Taco Bell folks noticed when Chuck stopped coming through the drive through. And Dave said they probably had to close that one. <laughs> <laughs> they, they very well, uh, they did for a time that one shut down. Uh, it was sadly only for renovations. Um, but yeah, you know, one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about was the time that I went through the drive through and instead of 20 bucks, please pull through. Good to see you, Chuck. It was, you know, Hey Chuck, you eat too much. It's like, wow. Oh and a God. good day to you too. Yeah. Wow. That, that now, see, we, we talked about whether being able to say to a loved one, but this was basically somebody that wasn't even a friend. Yeah. Like, and I remember just being mortified and, and pulling up to the window that day. And it was like, I always had a lie at the ready because I suspected at some point somebody would call me out on this. And I was like, no, you know, I'm, I'm always taking it back to the office. It's just a group of us guys that eat the same thing. They knew I was full of it. I knew I was full of it. But I had to do this dance and um, yeah, 
that was not not the best day. That was not the best day. So I drove down the road about a mile and a half to the next Taco Bell after that. And you know what? Now with dash door and food delivery, the person doesn't even have to be seen. You can pay for it and they can leave it. It makes it even easier for a food addict to hide. Absolutely. In isolation. Absolutely. And I am 100% convinced you are spot on with that. I think that that's probably we're in the midst of a serious epidemic of that right now, right? Because literally everything is at our fingertips. You don't have to get out of your pajamas. You don't even have to get out of bed. Just pick up your phone and place your order, right? And it comes right to your door. And it's scary, right? You know how many options there are for fast food and junk food and things like that, and how few options there are for healthy delivery services, right? Yeah. So. Well, well, you know, you know, I think about that show. If, I don't know if you ever watched it, My 600 Pound Life. Some of the individuals don't even get out of bed. Somebody's bringing them the food. Yeah. Yeah. The, there, there are definitely enablers there. And yeah, yeah I, I don't, it's hard for me to watch that show because it's, it's like so reminiscent. It's, I don't watch it. it we, got, we got rid of TV in 2019, but I yeah. we could watch it. We which, watched during dinner, which was not the best time actually. <laughs> but yeah, I feel so bad because you, you wonder that if they didn't have the people enabling them, I mean, it, it would be much harder for them to get that food. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, also the thing that I don't like about that show is that, you know, having had weight loss surgery myself again, like you're, you're missing out on the core fundamentals of nutrition, right? They're just saying like, you need to lose this amount of weight before you can have the surgery. You need to prove to me that you can do it. They never tell you how to do it. Just stop eating the food. Like it's that easy. It's not that easy. You can't just wave a magic wand, man. You're like missing such a huge huge, enormous piece of the puzzle here. And so for that to go unaddressed, like I'm a pretty easygoing guy, but that angers me. It's like, you are doing this person a disservice. You're telling them that they're going to die, but you're not telling them how to save their life. Right. That to me is not fair. Yeah. Mary says any tip for those supporting those who are on a tough weight loss journey, Mary, do you mean like, are you the one on the journey and you want to know how people su can support you? Or do you want to know how to support others? Or maybe Chuck can answer it both ways. Uh, how to support somebody who's on a weight loss, a tough, mean, weight loss a journey. tough weight loss journey, a tough not, weight loss not, journey, not enable them. Number one, not have food in the environment that they can't eat. Yeah. That's, that's what I would say. So, yeah, I mean, you, you got to get, uh, get the crack out of the crack house. Uh, number one, right. Don't, don't be around uh, those things. Um, and then, you know, to just be there to love and support them. I'm sorry. There's a special guest who kind of like caught my attention. Do you know Dr. Alan Desmond? Ah, hey, yes, Jay, I met you? him. So nice to be, see you. I wish how you were wonderful. here. Oh my God, me too. You look great. How yeah. are you? How, wow, yeah, you I warned know. Chuck on my coming photo bomb. So nice to see you. You're nice looking glamorous you, as Dr. usual. Desmond. Oh my goodness. You, you have all the celebrities there. Yeah, this is my guy. He introduced me to Ethiopian food last night. Yeah, we had a really, really good meal last night, didn't we? No, it was so fantastic. good. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't had Ethiopian food for quite a while. But uh, I got to tell you, the uh, vegan scene in D.C. is thriving. We yeah. have been I've been eating my way around your nation's capital. <laughs> It's been absolutely fantastic. Oh my and I'm going to, I'm going to butt out. I've just been totally yeah. photobombing. So nice I'll talk to you see soon. You. Yeah. 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 Uh, Lovely to see you, AJ. Five Thanks, minutes. Dr. Desmond. Yep. All right, cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's uh, so cool to meet him. Uh, that's my dude I mean, right yeah, there. Yeah. You got some, you got, I think Brenda Davis is there. She told me she was going. Yeah. Brenda's going to be on the show in a little bit. Um, yeah. I'm going to be talking to a lot of people. I, I wish you were here. I mean, we I could know. totally do oh an my, episode. That'd swap, be so right? fun. How many people came to the conference this year? Uh, 600. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, 600. Um, ordinarily it's a little bit more, but we're still trying to allow for social uh, distancing and, and being safe and all of that good stuff. So yeah. Um, it's it's still a healthy room. Like I'm looking straight past the camera right now, and that conference room over there is pretty daggone full, and it's it's kind of cool to see. Yeah, that's great. So you do think that the environment is important because you oh oh going back that. to what we were talking, yes. So like especially early in the journey, right? Um, when you are having a lot of questions about how strong your willpower and how strong your resolve is, right? So it's best just not to have that stuff around you right so like taco bell became the enemy to me mcdonald's became the mortal enemy to me and they were not in my house they were not in my life they were nowhere to be found except for when i was driving past them um, on my way to and from work right so um it's best just to get all of that stuff out of the environment um if if you're able to do so 
And if you're with somebody who is not eating the way that you are, one of the best things, and I've learned this actually since my father-in-law has moved in and he, uh, he, boy, he, he loves him some standard American diet. So uh, suddenly I've got like, and people like will be shocked to know this. Like I've got like hostess mini donuts. I've got like uh, potato chips galore, tater tots. Um, it's just like all kinds of like, un- like uh, Twinkies and uh, moon pies and just stuff that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole now. So when I go into my pantry, like I'm actually seeing a lot of that and it it is taken, um, it took me a long time to get to the point where I am today, where I'm able to deal with that. But I do know that, you know, years earlier in this journey, I'd, I'd be lost. Right. So there are other people who I'm sure are in that position um, that when that stuff enters the house, it's, it's just all over. So you have to be honest with yourself. And so if you are in a position where you have somebody who is not on that healthy journey with you, um, the best thing that you can do is establish your own cabinet, right? So this is exclusively yours. That is exclusively theirs. And there can be no cross-contamination. That way, when you open the cabinet drawer, you're not seeing the ring dings. You're not seeing the moon pies. You're not seeing the potato chips. When you open that drawer, you're seeing your healthier options. And that means you're not going to trigger your cravings, right? So out of sight, out of mind, that's the best thing that you can do if you're in that situation. And I actually think, you know, that's going to work. You know, it's not, it's if not I got to the point where it was bothering you, you'd do something, right? Yeah. yeah. You would have to have that conversation with the person and an open and honest one. And, you know, I think that if that person truly cared about you, they're going to want to support you. And um, you'll, you'll come to some sort of an agreement one way or another, you can always work it out. Don't be afraid to have those conversations. Um, even if they may think that you're crazy, um, and they think that you're doing this like whole crazy hippie vegan thing. And the next thing you know, you're going to be hugging trees and burning incense and sage and all of that good stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, just stay strong be like, it's not about that. It's about my health. And, and this is what I got to do for me. So, you know, I, I need your support. If you love me, support me. And nine times out of 10, they will. Yep. Hey, Jesse, you want to know, is your wife plant-based? She is. She nice. is. She, uh, she absolutely is. She's got a little bit more leniency, um, in her diet, as far as, uh, the kinds of plant-based food she will eat. Um, but, uh, but she is indeed plant-based. She's such a softy for animals though. I mean, my God, does this woman love her some animals? So, uh, the convincing her to go on a plant-based diet was not much of a chore, uh, for me at all, at all, at all. Wow. You know, I'm curious, Chuck, have you ever tried to recreate some of your Taco Bell favorites in a healthy manner? Oh, I have thought about this, right? It took me honestly a while to even get comfortable with the idea of eating a wrap because it was, I just associated it with a burrito. I don't care how healthy it is. Um, I just associated it with like, this is what I used to eat. I can't do it. Um, over the last couple of years, I've become more comfortable with, well, actually this is like just whole grains, whole beans. Like there's no salt added. There's no, you know, fat, there's no oil. There's none of that crap in there. And so when you add that with a ton of kimchi, oh my God, do I love beans, rice, and kimchi wrap that up. I should have talked about that earlier. I'm good to go with that. You throw some greens in there too. Like I'm okay. I can eat that every day and feel very comfortable with that now. Um, but I would never try to replicate anything like a chicken quesadilla or a cheesy potato burrito. I think that's when you're really opening up um, Pandora's box, you know, a recipe for disaster. Um, because sure, you know, you could find a vegan way to do it. Doesn't necessarily mean it would be the best idea. Right. Is it is the food pretty healthy of working every day at PCRM or people sneaking junk in? It's pretty healthy, actually. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're kind of, you know, in this community where we know so much about the science and what, you know, the food can do both good and bad to your body, right? So when you're, you're kind of ensconced in that, you're ingrained in it, and it's day in and it's day out, it, it makes it easier to make healthier choices. Plus, like, I'm not the best cook in the world, but let me tell you, like, there are some people in the office, AJ, that can do some incredible things with the simplest of ingredients. And I'm not saying they're nearly as good as your snickerdoodle cookies, 
but they're pretty daggone good. <laughs> that must be so fun where you work. It is. I mean, it's it's cool, right? Like, um, I don't want to say that we're a group of do-gooders, but we we genuinely believe in what it is that we're doing and the positive impact that can have um, on a global effect. And for me, it's it's not just the global effect. It's like reaching one person at a time and hearing from one person at a time um, just absolutely makes my day because it's like, that's another person that we've reached. Right. And it's kind of like every time I do a show, I feel like I'm talking to the old me and letting that person know that it's going to be okay. There is a healthier way and you can find it. You can get on that path and you can succeed on it. And you're going to have a greater appreciation for food than you ever could have possibly imagined before, right? You think you love food now? No, my friend, just wait a few years and wait and see. And so it's, it's kind of cool when other people are having that epiphany as well. Yeah. Well, I always said like, if vegan had a president, it should be Dr. Barnard. <laughs> I, he just walked by a few minutes ago. Oh, uh, I will let him know. Yeah. I'm really throw his hat in there. He's so humble. The person that dissed you, the girlfriend, uh, does she know how like gorgeous and successful you are now? I mean, the humble part of me is like, why does it matter? But there's also a big part of me that's like, boy, I hope she realizes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I hope she's watching today. I was like, Hi. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure she does. I'm, I'm, oh, oh. I'd be shocked if she didn't, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, it's okay. Like, uh, in the end, I think that we both wound up, um, in a much better place. I don't know exactly where she is. Um, but I think that you would have had to have been in a pretty negative space. If you were asking that much negativity of another person, you know, feeling comfortable enough to ask somebody to do something like that and essentially emotionally beat them down every single day. Like what's going on in her life, you know? So I hope that she's found a little bit more peace these days. Nice. Do you remember, you know, the dark night of the soul that was your really, you know, that moment when you just said enough, do you, do you, do you remember that feeling in that moment? And why don't some people reach that moment? I don't know. I don't know. Um, and, and I don't exactly remember the exact moment. I just remember being fed up and, knowing that I was going to die if I didn't make some changes. And so I needed to make some changes and, uh, and boy, did I make them. Um, and I, I don't know why people don't realize that they have reached rock bottom or maybe rock bottom for them is a lot lower than they thought that it was, or maybe they've just decided that it's easier to continue going down this path. And they've already thrown in the towel because it's just going to be too hard to change. Um, and those are the people, honestly, AJ, that I want to reach the most, right? I want the people who are in the deepest, darkest holes, like just in the depths of hell when it comes to their health. And I want to, you know, be the one to throw down that lifeline and, uh, and pull them up and let them know that it's going to be okay. That is such a beautifully, that's so beautiful to say that. Thank you. I appreciate so much the work you do. There's a comment from Angela that you have, uh, uh, I have the most amazing guests I know, but it's Violet who says you have an amazing voice. I've always said that even if you didn't look so good, I, you, you have, I love the sound of your voice, which is Thank perfect you. for somebody that does a podcast. Thank you. It comes in handy. Yeah. yeah. So is your family proud of you? I, yeah, I think that they are. Um, I know um, there, there are a lot of questions have been asked. Um, people looking to uh, improve their own health, um, which is pretty humbling. And um, I know that they're, they're very, very proud of uh, all the things that uh, I've been able able to accomplish, um, uh, both personally and professionally. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to be a little bit of uh, inspiration for some of them as well. Nice. Well, Chuck, it's always great and inspiring. And just uh, talking to you, you're so motivating and positive and just adorable too. Cool. Well, I feel the same way about you. I, I love coming on your show. I love it when you come on the exam room, like, you know, if you and I ever got together, I'm telling you, we if we teamed it. up for a project, I mean, it would be the most incredible thing I, it's, in the history. It's swirling in my head because, you know, you're the savory and I'm the sweet and there's got to be something in there right there. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yeah. All right. And, and to Let's take it the time to do it during a busy conference, I really appreciate it. Oh, are you kidding me, man? This has been a blast. I'll do it any day. Just, just right. name it and I'll be here.
Yeah, and I, thank you so much. You guys don't forget to subscribe to listen to the exam room podcast. You can listen to it afterwards on iTunes. You can watch it live daily, Monday through Friday at noon Eastern time, which is 9 a.m. Pacific time. You got it. Thank All you right. so much, AJ. Oh you are God. the best. Well, you too. Thank you so much, Chuck. It was such a wonderful time spent with you. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 2 p.m. today as we continue our discussion of food addiction, where we're going to understand food addiction, the nutrition, the mindset, the hope, and recovery with Dr. Frank Sepatino. Take care of